Move this. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm Brian. My co-presenter today is Mike Jarvis. We're both from OSI Soft, and uh, I want to first thank you for you know a nice spring day in the basement. I know you could uh, be upstairs and looking out the windows and stuff, but uh, here we're going to talk about critical infrastructure. The cloud loves me. The cloud loves me not. And uh, the way I'd like to open the talk a little bit is. First to say, critical infrastructure means a lot of things to a lot of different people. And uh, for the government, for instance, I forget, it's uh, over a dozen critical sectors are, uh, they've identified. To me, banking isn't all that critical. I mean, yeah, I like to be able to get to my money when I need it, but no one's going to die if I don't get to my bank account. So that's kind of what we're focused on in, in our talk is we're taking critical maybe a little bit narrower than us, than the government does. We're, we're talking about things like things that can cause fatalities or cause the lights to go out, things that people really, really depend on for, uh, for their daily lives. Um, and the way we've organized the talk is into uh, really three scenarios. And, and honestly, we didn't expect this many people this morning, so I said, oh, Let's try to spice it up so we, we're going to have a debate kind of style. And uh, Mike, Mike's job isn't, uh, his day job isn't security. His job actually is to build a cloud product uh, that our company makes. And he's actually going to have to argue against it. So it should be really fun when he does that. Um, but we're going to take turns on, on that. So the person uh, arguing uh, against cloud uh, really in favor of status quo is going to wear the safety vest, right? He's, he's like, he's like, whoa, I'm not sure about this cloud stuff. Uh, maybe we shouldn't slow down and, and take some time at that. And, uh, and the other person will, will argue the other side. And so that's how, how we've got things structured for you this morning. Um, and I'll, I will do the obligatory uh, company introduction slide here. So who the heck is OSI Soft? Um, we're a company over in the East Bay, about 1,100 employees, and one of the reasons I wanted to be at B-Sides, a security manager, is to engage this community. We do serve critical infrastructure sectors. That's what we're all about. We've been in business for 35 years. We're heavily re recruiting, so that's my pitch. My security team needs you. Um, and on this cloud stuff, there's, there's no... <laughs> There's no one answer uh, is the right answer. What you'll find is that we're very much, uh, uh, it's, it's very situational. So uh, the way we're going to score the debate is uh, whoever says the word cloud too many times loses. So Kelly is going to uh, help us keep track of that, but help her keep track of us. So if one of us uses the word cloud, be sure it gets uh, marked up there. Um, and, uh, and with that, uh, yeah, the critical infrastructure sectors that we deal in, power, oil and gas, chemicals, metals mining, pulp paper, pharma, even your data centers are on there. So these are the things that uh, if something goes wrong in power, that's self-explanatory, but uh, in pharma, that's one of our scenarios. You're going to notice that's kind of important, right? So uh, let's, uh, with no further ado, I will don the safety jacket first. If you can hang on there. All right, to, to get us warmed up, um, I'll introduce scenario one. Scenario one is our natural gas system, right? And, and to kind of get people warmed up and into it, um, uh, I'll, I'll introduce the, the system at the top. You can't read that font. Sorry. So, so at the top of the natural gas system, this font's super small, so just call it out. We got the producing wells, right? The gas comes out of the ground somewhere and has to get cleaned up because it's got a lot of sulfur uh, gas in it that would erode pipes and stuff. Then it gets compressed so it can be transmitted through the pipelines and uh, goes to things like power plants, right? So here you got one critical infrastructure sector feeding uh, to another, 
And then, uh, uh, you know, the, there's these lines are all over the place, right? The geography is, is immense. We got pipelines from Canada all the way down to the U.S. And uh, it's, it's geographically really hard to secure. So uh, then there's storage, which is a cool thing. Electricity you can't store very well, but the equivalent of a dam for um, natural gas is underground storage. This is like a salt cave that's been uh, um, uh, salt dome, I should say, under the earth or uh, other kind of uh, fissures in the earth that they have figured out you can use as a storage tank, if you will. And then, um, then there's the distribution system that we're familiar with for commercial industry, for uh, consumers. A lot of, uh, lot of uh, places in the country do use gas uh, right at the residential level even. So uh, the, it's immense, right? A large, large amount of our uh, nation depends on the natural gas system. Uh, did I miss any of the big things here? Physically remote, that's a tough one. And uh, this, uh, this issue where the industry is, not only does it supply fuel, but it consumes electricity, right? So you got this symbiotic relationship. So we'll get into that in the scenario here. Uh, all right, next slide. So to do this, we uh, try to get you going here with some uh, memes. And uh, for the natural gas system, um, you know, if, if you're a diehard fan, there was the arch villain there, Thomas Gabriel. That uh, the, the line I liked was, uh, you know, he, Bruce Willis had really pissed him off, right? And because he just killed his girlfriend or something, and uh, he said, "Ah, oh, you know, how can we take him out? How much gas should I send to the power plant? Send it all, you know." So now that's that's a contrived scenario, right? How can uh, it's, it's you know artistic. Uh, uh, liberties were taken there to send all the gas to one station uh, isn't really all that feasible. But anyway, it was it was a movie. But if someone could get in to the SCADA control system and send the signals to control the valves, uh, that would be kind of bad, right? You could you could definitely turn the gas off. You could potentially cause a line to overpressurize. Uh, you can cause a line to overpressurize by opening it too, right? So having having these uh, valves at the right positions is very, very important. So the idea of um, a data plane and a control plane for operating the grid, uh, operating the transmission system for natural gas is very important. So why would we ever want to use the cloud for something like this? Why would we ever do that? It's just kind of crazy, right? To put control signals uh, through public infrastructure. This is uh, this seems like a recipe for disaster. As a as a security guy, I think uh, we we really need to avoid that. Maybe you know I don't think you can avoid it with a law. Uh, maybe uh, maybe there's some other way we can avoid it. But at the other hand, it might be it might be too late. So. With that, I've used my, my minute for uh, this first piece, and I'll turn it over to Mike to argue why we have to use the cloud. Thanks, Brian. Uh, as Brian said, I'm the product manager for a lot of our cloud products at OSIsoft. Uh, and what I do is I, I talk to our customers and try to convince them into buying our into our, our cloud vision and starting to use some of our cloud software. Um, so I, I talk to customers like Brian and, you know, the, the oil and gas guys will say, no, we can never put our SCADA control signals in the cloud. Um, but when I speak to them, uh, some of the, the arguments I have against that are, what kind of uptime did you have with your uh, private infrastructure? Uh, with somebody like Amazon or Azure, I can get three nines. That's something like 45 minutes of downtime per month. Uh, if I look at some of our on-prem customers who want to keep everything internal and use their own IT shops to manage everything, uh, they'll have downtimes over a weekend, and that'll be down for three days. <laughs> That's much longer than any 45-minute outage that I would ever have from some kind of public cloud infrastructure. Uh, so there's a lot more uptime, and I see that as a very big advantage. Uh, the meme that I have here are the, is the polar vortex. Um, can you guys hear me okay? 
Well, now it's better. All right, so we'll, uh, we'll we'll try to make sure everybody can hear us here. Is that is that better? Uh, so the the meme that I have here is the polar vortex, uh, and this is designed to talk about the great success that uh, the they had in the state of West Virginia, where they had the the very extreme cold outage, uh, and the polar vortex and the Arctic blast was coming through the the Northeast, and they needed a lot of communication between all of the gas suppliers and the gas consumers, and using that public infrastructure, it was a great success because they could keep the the gas generators on and they could keep the northeast warm so that businesses can operate and so that uh, everyone here can go to work uh, as uh, you know I'm a, I'm a San Francisco resident so we're not usually worried about keeping the heat on uh, it's usually pretty moderate here uh, but in places like the northeast uh, that can be a very big problem and you need to be able to make sure that the the homes are warm and that the commercial side uh, is able to uh, to keep the uh, the lights on uh, so for some of these reasons, uh, that's why I think the SCADA control signals would be just fine moving to the cloud um, from all the advantages that they have in those scenarios. All right, so another part of the natural gas system isn't just the control plane. There's a lot of data, right? We're in this era of pervasive sensing. So with pervasive sensing, uh, we're looking at things like is is the pipeline leaking? Is it vibrating? Is it moving? Where I used to live upstate of Washington, they had landslides. So you need pervasive sensing all across that pipeline that spans from Canada all the way uh, to the U.S. So how how, do, how is that done? Well, it's it's wireless, right? Wireless is the way to do that. You don't. Uh, uh, take a pipeline that was built way before the internet even existed and uh, expected to have wired infrastructure for this kind of telemetry. So as a hacker, what can I do with that? Certainly this technology uh, could, can be jammed. Uh, and would that really be a problem for vibration and so on? Not really. I think what I would do as an attacker is I would try to see if I could use that telemetry signal to get from it's non-operational data, but could I get from a non-operational network into an operational network? Could I find a way to penetrate their defenses? And I could come in from a place on the pipeline where they're not, they don't have cameras, they don't have anything. I can just kind of be in the, you know, really well hidden and try to find a way into their system. What do you say to that? So for these pipelines that are very distributed, uh, that's a lot of uh, routers and switches and different things that you're going to need to be able to maintain. And with the, the uptime that your team had last year, you had a, a three-day outage. Uh, do you really want them to put in all the time and effort that it takes to instrument all along this pipeline with their private infrastructure? And how sensitive are those signals? It's uh, not something in the, the pipeline that needs to be immediate. Uh, a lot of these things are items that are very slow moving, slow changing, and it's simply telemetry data. So I would argue how important is that data to you? And a lot of that is uh, data that uh, may not be critical in uh, a second by second uh, uh, data points. All right, so another feature you'll find in the natural gas system is that uh, these, these systems are so critical that there are control centers. And the control centers are geographically redundant, right? So, so um, maybe uh, there's something up in Northern California and another control center in Southern California, for instance. So when I'm thinking about how those control centers might rely on a cloud, I'm going, may, if they communicate with each other across a, a public cloud, isn't that a place where as a, a, a new place that I can get in? And think about, think about what I could do as, uh, as a hacker in, in control center, not just a compressor station, but all of them. Now we're talking Die Hard 4, baby. I can, I can move that gas, right?
All right, so now you want to take that existing team with their low uptime, right? They were down for the weekends, and you want them to build not one data center, but you want them to build two data centers for you. It's going to have the same weaknesses across the board, and it's going to have the, the same kind of problems that a, a single data center would have. Uh, you might have some advantages if it's in Northern California and Southern California being geographically distributed. Uh, it wouldn't be affected by the same kind of natural disaster. But a lot of that could also be handled by the public cloud. Uh, if you look at somebody like Azure, uh, they have two data centers in lots of regions. Um, you can also go pairing from East Coast to West Coast. Uh, so not only would it be uh, across Northern California and Southern California, um, you can go across continents, across the U.S., and around the world using the public cloud. Uh, and using your, your existing staff, I would argue that there must be something that they would be better at. You know, if you're going to look at this from a, a business decision, uh, do you want your existing IT team to spend twice the amount of time to build a redundant data center that you could do as easily in the cloud by turning on a, another switch? Uh, I would argue that this would be a, a great reason to go to the cloud. Just said cloud again. All right, I think we have another one here uh, in the in the gas system, and the gas system is really important, right? So. I mentioned this in the introduction. The gas transmission system in particular, those compressor stations, really, really need power, right? Compressors don't run by themselves. Uh, there's no hamster wheel. So gas system needs electricity. The power plants need the gas to make the electricity. We've got this symbiotic relationship. Why don't we do away with that? Uh, and uh, because that's forced us to rely on the cloud, in my view, and I think we should, you know, do things like have generators and fuel cells, and um, we can't really, if we have these systems coupled so closely, uh, it only takes one of them to go down. Maybe as a hacker, I can, I can get in to the natural gas control system from, uh, from a power plant. So I want to limit my attack points. And, and say, hey, let's, let's not have so many ways in to the gas system. Well, if you're limiting all of these ways into the gas system, then it looks like you're going to have some uh, way to communicate to your end suppliers. So we're looking at this connection from our gas consumers uh, to the power plant. And if you want some sort of private connection, then are you going to set up a, a separate VPN for each connection? You're going to have a separate router, a separate switch for each uh, uh, end consumer that you have? What happens when you go up to 100 of these power plants and consumers? Are you going to have 100 routers sitting in a rack, each with their own software? And remember, you just built that redundant data center. Uh, so all your people who are managing the, those redundant data centers, uh, what if they forget to upgrade the, the software and the BIOS on all those routers? Uh, all of a sudden, everything is going to be out of date. And are you going to argue that that is going to be more secure than the cloud offering? Uh, here, here I am losing again. <laughs> um, but the, the cloud offering is going to be maintained by somebody else. And I'm hoping that somebody else, whether it be AWS or if it's somebody like Microsoft Azure, uh, they're much more progressive about installing these new patches and updates than your existing IT team may be, uh, especially if they're spending all of their time with these redundant data centers and worrying about uh, the new technology as it comes up. Uh, with the cloud, that's one way to outsource a lot of this so that you can allow your team to focus on what they're good at. Uh, and I would argue that the, the IT teams that we have today are going to be much more valuable um, in a different type of role than simply managing VPN connections and managing the, the software updates on routers and switches. All right. The, this is the last piece on the gas pipeline. And uh, ultimately, with a lot of critical infrastructure, when the chips are down, it's, it's the crews. It's the service crews that keep this thing going, keep it from cascading down. And what I'm thinking is, in the old days, the maintenance crews didn't have, you know, their iPhone with them. They weren't, they weren't relying on that. They had radios, right? That's, that's uh, how the dispatch crews uh, dispatch them. And if they're relying on something like their iPhone or Google Maps to find where they're going, 
that just doesn't seem really good to me. I think they should have the towers along the pipelines so they always have radio contact so these guys know exactly where they're going. They're not relying on public infrastructure to communicate and dispatch those service crews. And, uh, you know, I, I get it. That that's, It seems like there's some advantages there, but in the end, uh, when things are really going haywire, can you depend on that to be there? I would argue that these maintenance crews are already out in the field. And everyone here, just like the maintenance crew, probably has a, a smartphone in their pocket. And we're connected up to Google Maps. And if we want our, our maintenance crews to have the information that they need, then the rest of the public should have that as well. So this is more of the, the open source idea, where everybody has access to the information that they need, not just the maintenance crews, because it's not just them that are going to be affected by any kind of outage. Uh, these maintenance crews should have the same level of support that our public uh, infrastructure would have. Uh, and also, these uh, maintenance crews are out in the field. How are they going to be maintaining separate connections between each radio tower? Uh, are you going to use your existing IT force again, um, who's managing these redundant data centers, and they're doing other things with these uh, separate VPNs for all the connections to the gas consumers, uh, and now they have another thing on their plate, which could be very easily replaced by the cloud infrastructure. Uh, this is outsourcing, but it's outsourcing for the public good, so that uh, instead of maintaining all of these things in a private sense, if we move this to more of the public cloud, then everybody benefits, not just the maintenance crews. Um, and these maintenance crews may have a higher level of priority, uh, but everybody needs access to this type of information. I have a rebuttal before you advance. So I, I forgot about this, but Im imagine that these guys are relying on public infrastructure to be dispatched. Wouldn't it be great if you're, if you're really an advanced adversary to send those guys on a red herring, you know, get them, have a decoy event, send them way over to the other side of uh, nowhere, and then and then execute the real attack. What do you say to that? Yeah, so that's tough. <laughs> that, that's why he's the security expert. I'm uh, I'm just the product guy. <laughs> All, All right. right. Switch the safety vest. Okay. All right, so in this next scenario, I get to take the uh, naysayer to the cloud. Uh, so this is a lot. Of, this is what a lot of my customers will tell me, and I always try to uh, convince them into using the cloud. So this is kind of an opposite of uh, of what I normally do. And all I have to say is what m some of my customers tell me all the time, uh, even though I, I'm hoping that they're wrong, and we're trying to sell them that they're wrong. So uh, it's it's starting to work as well. Uh, so this scenario number two is part of the pharmaceutical contract manufacturing. And the idea is that these contract manufacturing companies are receiving very sensitive information about making an active ingredient. And the active ingredient might be for some of the big pharma companies like Pfizer or somebody like Johnson & Johnson who need just a little bit of this active ingredient and they don't have or they don't want to invest in the specialty vessels that would be required to make this specialty active ingredient. So this is very common across the board for a lot of pharmaceutical companies, and these are a lot of the companies that I work with all the time. Now, what a contract manufacturer would do is they would have separate trains set up throughout their manufacturing plant, and these trains are kind of like building blocks. They can switch out vessels, uh, and the vessels would be uh, these skids that are specified from the, the parent company, somebody like uh, a Pfizer or Johnson & Johnson. So at any snapshot in time, uh, I might have train number one would be running a proprietary active ingredient from the uh, contract manufacturing company that they're making from uh, some of their early research, uh, while train number two could be in a, a different configuration, and this would be making the active ingredient for a third party. 
Uh, train number three might be in a cleaning cycle. So this is one contract manufacturing company, and they're making lots of different things. Now in train number two, they need to be able to share this data about making the active ingredient for the third party, and that third party could be held to uh, various FDA regulations. Uh, and we're going to walk through uh, some of these scenarios, and we'll try to identify if we should be using the cloud or an on-premise solution for some of the, the ideas here. So in the first scenario, we want to decide if we want to be storing and analyzing data and information directly from the skids. So the skids would be the vessels that are part of this train, uh, which are part of making that active ingredient, that drug. And the meme that we have here is the Chinese tainted heparin that uh, came out a few years ago. And the idea is that uh, if I'm a, a pharma company or a contract manufacturer, I want to do all of, this all of this information processing and storing the information and analyzing the big data on premise. I've always done it on premise. It doesn't make sense to put this stuff in the cloud. I just I want to be you know just normal. I want to wear my, my safety vest. Uh, I should be the uh, the gray hair up here uh, with this, the safety vest, but it's nice to take the other side every once in a while. Uh, so the you know, some of the, the main ideas are that uh, myself, the contract manufacturing company, I need to keep accurate copies of this information. And if I put it into the cloud, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not really comfortable with that. I don't really know what that means. I'm not used to doing that. Uh, and many of these pressures and temperatures would be uh, very tightly regulated by your third party. Uh, they would need to uh, look at a vessel and say that the temperature never exceeded 40 degrees centigrade at a, while we're making this active ingredient. If it extends that for any period of time, then that active ingredient might be garbage. You'd have to throw it out. So for these reasons, uh, I want to be able to keep this information inside of my premise. I don't want any kind of connection up to the cloud. Uh, that's not even part of my vocabulary right now. All right, so um, the only choice is for one company to be in charge of the, the whole thing. I mean, that's the alternative he's, he's trying to force me into, right? So we have this environment where we need to use these um, um, third-party manufacturers uh, to, to make this active ingredient. And the failure here for the heparin, uh, they just didn't give us the data. That's that's would be my my rebuttal. Now the next piece is this FDA validation of software updates, and with our on-prem software, uh, I have a separate. Uh, scenario, uh, a separate set of servers for my production servers and my test servers. And I get new software from my vendors, I put it on the test system, I test it for a series of months, I fill out 400 pages of paperwork, and then maybe eventually I would upgrade my production servers. That's how I've done it for the last 10, 15 years, and that's the way I want to keep doing it. I, I don't see any reason to change this, this works for me, uh, I have to stick to these FDA regulations. Uh, there's a, a screenshot of the, this Title 21 uh, chapter, uh, it was uh, CFR 21 Part 11. Uh, this is part of the compliance that I'm required to do. And this is part of the, the piece that requires this accurate copies of data. Uh, and I need to be in full control over any of the software updates that happens to uh, the servers that are running active ingredients for my third parties or for my own proprietary uh, drugs that I'll be making for uh, some of the, the other research that my company would be doing. You know, these, uh, these regulations are killing me. You know, I'm trying to make drugs, trying to save people's lives, and the FDA keeps throwing more and more regulation on here, and to, to make a drug... Uh, they want me to leave my servers unpatched because if a patch comes through, I got to do all these regulation things. This is this is not the right thing. We need to move to the cloud. We need to allow companies to update quicker so their systems can be safer. Yeah. 
All right, now as a contract manufacturing company, I need to be able to maintain connections to my end customers. Uh, now on this screen, this has uh, some of the servers that OSIsoft uses. Uh, it's not particularly important that uh, I explain what each one of these does, but the idea is that w as a contract manufacturing company, I need to be able to send data to my end customers. So I would be sending data to some of the big pharma companies out here. And to do this, I generally maintain an active VPN tunnel to each one of my customers. I have a, a separate set of routers and switches, and I maintain that constant VPN so that I can share data while I'm making their active ingredient. And this is the way I've always done it. I don't see any reason to change. Uh, I have a, a direct connection. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's safe. And it's uh, we usually only pass f back and forth uh, CSV files or text files, and I, I think those are, are, are pretty safe to uh, to be passing back and forth. Uh, so I, I don't I don't see any reason to to change. Uh, I, I need to be sure that my information that I'm passing cannot be adulterated in any way, and I think this is a, a good solution for uh, for what we have today. Adulterated. Wow. So so. The contract manufacturing organization is, is communicating with dozens of other organizations with a VPN, level two, connected, passing files. I'm sure that the antivirus works perfect. I, I just can't see that that is a scalable architecture going forward. We need to do something better. We need to proxy that information transfer through something in the middle. Uh, I think the cloud is a great place to have that proxy, and and uh, that's that's uh, the strategy we we believe adds security to this instead of um, adulterated data. All right, so my manufacturing process is uh, integrated with the ERP system that we've always had. Uh, I have uh, an SAP system that's been there for a while. I have a whole team that maintains it. They're really good at maintaining it. Uh, it only takes maybe six months to get something changed in it. Uh, so that's a, a pretty good process that, uh, that we have right now. Um, <clears throat> And I, I want to continue this uh, this investment with the, the on-prem system. There's a lot of legacy features that I like to use. Uh, there are lots of older systems that I want to keep integrated with it. Uh, I, I just can't see how we could ever move forward. Uh, we need to continue the investment uh, with the, the great people that we have and to continue to allow them to uh, thrive with these uh, historical and legacy systems. Uh, again, I don't see any reason to move to the cloud uh, because the cloud wouldn't support a lot of these legacy features that my company requires in order to do business. I think I'll only talk about one of the features that that kind of system supports, but uh, and I didn't introduce the meme for uh, for the pro cloud argument here, but one of the projects our company was involved with was a program for elite athletes and uh, and uh, special forces, right? So the idea of uh, right out at the edge in in these uh, health companies is how how can people heal better? How do we know if if an athlete is actually able to perform at his full potential? So if we don't have these kind of cloud-based systems to gather information, you know, we're talking we're not talking about your everyday Fitbit. We're talking about something a bit more detailed here. But uh, we, we need these cloud systems if we're ever going to move from the old way that's really slow to get these new cures to market. So that's, that's why we need the cloud. Now, another piece that I have here is to ensure some of this security compliance. Uh, there's a lot of regulations that I'm under from the FDA, and I, I'm pretty sure that the only way I can satisfy all of these regulations is by having my own systems that I fully control. Uh, these are uh, some of the standards that are out there for specific industries, and it's not just pharma in this case. Uh, for the companies in uh, vertical markets that OSI Soft's 
serves. Um, there's many things like nuclear or oil and gas, and they all have their own security compliance regulations. And when I comply with these regulations, um, that's going to make me very secure. Uh, I can simply follow the letter of the law, and I can be sure that uh, I... <laughs> You warned me about this one. I, I can be sure that I'm going to be 100% safe, and, and also I'm not connected to the cloud and you know all the the hackers that are are up there. So I uh, I'm pretty sure I, I just follow these security compliance rules, and uh, you know I can I can sleep easy at night. Yeah, give me a break. The regulations are going to save us, um, and the security standards and the compliance frameworks. I, I mean, people in here, I know you, you um, probably are very, uh, you probably have your special uh, 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 set of standards or frameworks that you like. And it's not to say best practices are wrong in any way, but what, what we see is that this is a minimum. And people don't go beyond the minimums in compliance. So that's the real problem. It's not that these, these things are, uh, are, are bad. It's that they're not enough, but when you make it a regulation, companies often interpret compliance as that's all they have to do and no more. So that's why we need the cloud. We need to be able to move the security function into a place where uh, specialists can go beyond the minimums. Time to switch the vest. Yeah, yeah, we gotta switch the vest again, so I can finally take off the uh, the safety vest and uh, I can go back to supporting the, the public cloud, which is what I wanted to do from the beginning. Um, so painful talking about those pharmaceutical regulations and the stuff. Um, that's, that's literally what a lot of my customers will tell me, uh, and I have convinced several of them to start migrating to the, the public cloud. So they have uh, some very good arguments, but uh, Brian also helped me uh, address some of them. So to set up this third scenario, um, smart city, and it's it's nothing um, unlike the prior two uh, scenarios where Mike and I have deep uh, experience in it. Smart city is an ascent, right? It's it's uh, probably more of a concept than a reality today. So uh, we, if we didn't have answers for you uh, or interesting uh, dilemmas in the earlier scenarios, this one is a far more blue sky. So let me try to set it up a little bit, but what we're talking about with Smart City, you'll find a thousand definitions for it. Again, we're going to focus on the utilities, services, transportation, just the electricity, water, communication, a bit of emergency service, and uh, transportation aspect. Some of the places we do have experience, I've listed here the airports, uh, data centers, medical centers, and as odd as it sounds, even stadiums. So uh, with that, uh, I guess the... Uh, the first one goes goes my way here as arguing uh, as an anti-public uh, cloud infrastructure. I said it, didn't I? Cloud. Uh, so San Francisco. We're in San Francisco. Why not bring this one up, right? City's own, own network. Um, how good is that, right? City's own administrator locked them out. And by the way, the control signals for SCADA were running on that network too. So... Uh, you know, I'm not so sure that, that uh, maintaining the uh, infrastructure in-house uh, privately is uh, the way to go here. It, it sure, sure seems like uh, it was a problem. Um, so I argued the wrong way, didn't I? No, I'm a safety. <laughs> Forgot I have the vest on. Dang. Um, all right, so... Reset that. Anyway, um, so so to argue um, argue against this with Terry Childs is that um, this was a, a private infrastructure, and uh, if it was if it was public, who else could have done that besides Terry Childs? We always will have the insider threat. You'll never get rid of it entirely, but uh, at least it was insider. Even uh, even the now governor uh, went to went to go visit with uh, Mr. Childs, and he he gave him the password. He wasn't all bad guy, right? He just was proving a point. 
I would say this is more of an isolated incident. Uh, besides, this is San Francisco, right? Uh, now, the argument for the more public infrastructure uh, for s some of the high-speed networks and communication um, could be seen by some of the private ventures that are providing fiber. Uh, now, a disclaimer, the Lit San Leandro is a project that's sponsored by the president of uh, the company that Brian and I work for. Uh, but this Lit San Leandro project is a project where they're installing a, a a 10 gigabyte loop uh, fiber bandwidth and the the city the public infrastructure of San Leandro has provided a private company the right away to install the fiber and in return this private company is giving the city part of the bandwidth but they're not giving them everything so San Leandro is is giving this right away it's giving the public infrastructure but they're not getting the the full benefits of what is uh, uh, could be returned by the the full bandwidth of the fiber loop. Uh, so for these reasons, uh, I would argue that it would be much better if the public infrastructure and the public communications and the fiber were was uh, licensed out so that everybody and the the general public could take advantage of this infrastructure. The infrastructure is using the right-of-ways that are in the, the city streets and that are owned by the government. And so all of that public infrastructure should be used not by a private entity. It should be used by the public in general, by everyone in this room and by everyone in San Francisco, in San Leandro. Well, I'm glad I wasn't on record saying that. Now I'm teasing you. So how about emergency response? And what does what does that have to do with critical infrastructure and smart city? Um, let's take an example uh, that is uh, the, the NRC, right? Everyone will get the thing. You know, it was just a few years ago that Fukushima had uh, had its incident, and Japan did not have the equivalent of the NRC's emergency Re operations center. So, uh, the idea that there is this private uh, infrastructure that is connected to all the nuclear plants and monitoring it uh, in case of emergency uh, is, a, is a great uh, great story, right? So uh, I, I think that these kind of services like emergency uh, uh, services for smart cities, um, this, is, this is a good case for keeping it private, right? We want, we need to count on this stuff. Well, I could point out lots of flaws in some of those private ideas. Uh, one such flaw would be the 911 failure that affected 2. million people in Northern Virginia. Uh, so this was an outage caused by some of the private infrastructure. And I would argue that if we were using public infrastructure for some of this emergency communications, then we would not have had such a large and widely distributed outage. Uh, it also wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been down for such a long period of time and affected so many other people. Uh, there's lots of these critical emergency response centers, things like medical centers, um, and as, as Brian said, the, the NRC Emergency Communication Center. Uh, so I would argue that many of these could take some of the advantages of the public cloud uh, for the same things uh, for looking at the high uptime numbers of some of the public cloud infrastructure. And you know the, those high uptime numbers would have prevented or at least limited the effect of some of these wide outages. Uh, now, just a, a quick time check. Uh, I think we have time for one more topic here, so I might pick a good one. Okay. Yeah, All right. So, so I mentioned stadiums earlier, and the funny thing about stadiums is they're not normally critical, but for a couple hours on any given day, they are, right? There's a whole bunch of people that rely on those uh, facilities to be safe. And uh, we all saw this in spades when San Francisco was duking it out down in New Orleans, right? So, uh, hey, um, that could have been a disaster. The fact that half of the stadium stayed lit saved their bacon, right? So that's, uh, that's probably an argument for some really good engineering. Whoever built that stadium 
was smart enough not to have uh, you know one point of failure. At least at least half the stadium stayed up. So uh, my my argument is, um, hey, we if we go to cloud, isn't it one point of failure? If that cloud goes down, isn't it going to take it all out? Again, maybe that's one of those isolated incidents. Uh, if I look at some of the good things that the public cloud would be able to provide, uh, I can look at some of the, the other work that OSIsoft has done around these stadiums. And by analyzing and looking at the energy and water usage uh, of something like Safeco Field, uh, they're able to uh, look at the actual use and be able to optimize it. And by using some of the public cloud infrastructure and all the communication that it provides, they're able to r reduce the energy intensity. And uh, this is uh, kilobutanes uh, per square foot. So the idea is that over time, uh, by analyzing the data and using the cloud, again, another <laughs> marker on my side, by using the cloud, they're able to reduce the energy usage so that the stadium can become more green and we can conserve more energy and uh, we can be uh, a better society overall by giving the, uh, the data to the people and by using some of this public cloud infrastructure. And yeah, those three clouds. Four. Ah. All right, next one. We are in California and we're in a major drought, right? And uh, some people are proposing that uh, the cloud can save us from the drought. Imagine that. I, I suppose there would be a way to hype it. I live up in Sacramento, and uh, the idea there is, is just a, a lot simpler. Why don't we just conserve? Why don't we just tell, you know, you can't water this day, or, you know, here's your odd and even day, and here's the day that no one can water. We don't need this cloud uh, stuff. Well, I would argue that this California drought is uh, a really big problem. And uh, there was a, a recent article in the International Business Time uh, about some of the uh, marijuana plants that uh, they're using so much water and uh, it's starting to dry out some of these rivers. So I would argue that this is one of the, the major problems that we have here in, in San Francisco, uh, especially for the upcoming holiday tomorrow. Uh, I don't know if anybody's celebrating in, in Golden Gate Park. Um, <clears throat> but uh, OSI Soft is uh, helping to um, run some of these water conservation projects uh, with the universities. And the idea is that uh, these uh, research entities or universities need access to the water consumption data. And if you want to run a water cons conservation project, you need to identify the largest consumers. So, uh, for example, uh, if we were able to analyze everybody's water usage in this room, uh, some people would be larger consumers than others based on where you are on a hill. So if you look at a, a hill, something like Knob Hill, uh, it would be generally more expensive to consume water at the top of the hill because it takes energy to pump the water all the way up to the top than it would be to uh, consume water at the bottom of the hill. So if you can convince the people at the top of Snob Hill to uh, reduce some of their water usage, then that could be a, uh, a much more uh, effective way to conserve water. Uh, and in San Francisco, this is a fairly small region, but if we look at a, a larger part of California, uh, it costs money to run a, a conservation project, to send out flyers, or to analyze information. So you need to identify the largest consumers uh, in the residential space. Uh, in, the in the agricultural and commercial space, it's a, a different kind of topic, but there are still huge uh, gains to be seen, uh, for instance, in Sacramento, uh, from even some of the residential water consumers. I will go on record. I never thought I'd argue against weed. Anyway, um, so uh, demand response is uh, another area. And, uh, you know, I look at demand response as uh, uh, people are touting it as the answer for our critical infrastructure being stressed right to its limits. They'll say, oh, we'll just send out this signal that says, you know, uh, we're at the limit and uh, uh, we're going to start charging a lot more and people just back off. Kind of sounds, uh, might sound appealing to me, but I'm going as a hacker, I could have some fun with that, maybe. 
maybe even game the market, send some fake signals out. That could be that could be a whole bunch of fun. I, ju I just see a whole lot of ways to game the system. And uh, we know that when it's about money, and that's what this is about, uh, that's what that's what it'll be used for. Now, I would argue that we need a lot of this public cloud infrastructure to be able to support this demand response. Uh, we need to be able to communicate to businesses and individuals to uh, identify some of the large consumers and to be able to try to proactively uh, reduce some of the consumption at the peak times. Uh, there could be some sensitivity of this power generation data. Uh, and it kind of depends on the time and space. Uh, you can look at some of the old uh, disasters of Enron, uh, but I'm hoping that with the next version of a lot of our cloud-based software, that things like demand response would be a, a much easier program to run. If everybody has their smartphone and an app, uh, it would be very easy to send out that signal. we got 10 minutes left. Uh, so maybe we, we want... Uh, We're almost there. Yeah. So this is our last one. All right, so the big, the big magic uh, in uh, electricity that, that's holding society back, if, if you ask me, and I, I've spent many years uh, dealing with the industry, is we're not very good at storing electricity. The electricity system has to stay in balance between uh, consumption and generation uh, at all times. Electricity moves at the speed of light. It has to stay in balance. If it doesn't, we're facing a cascading blackout. So it's, it's really, really important to keep that system in balance. And what people are highlighting as storage uh, to help us out are, are the uh, electric vehicles. Your electric vehicles are batteries on wheels. They're uh, at, in quantity. It's going to be storage. And uh, that all sounds fine. But I go, you want to hook it up like this through Wi-Fi? Come on, this is this can be hacker city. This is this is going to be a, a real problem, and uh, I I'm just not sure we're ready uh, to solve the problems of of energy with uh, with this kind of system yet. Maybe we need to do what what China did. They they didn't charge they didn't charge to plug in your car. They just charge for the parking. You don't have to have all this Wi-Fi stuff. You just plug your car in. It charges. You pay for the parking. comes with your parking spot. So all this Wi-Fi, all this communication, not needed. Hey, I just want to charge my car. I, I just want to get where I'm going. Uh, I don't see any big problems uh, about storing or analyzing or sending this charging information over our public cloud infrastructure. Definitely going to lose this debate. Uh, <clears throat> but what I see in the field is that um, many customers are using the data and the information about charging the, the vehicles and the length of time they're charging and the time of day and the usage of those vehicles, how far they're driving to identify uh, the best locations to have these chargers to be placed. Uh, this is what Tesla has done. Uh, you can drive down Interstate 80, uh, and they've done a pretty good job. Uh, I, I would argue that if they're using some of the uh, public cloud infrastructure. They could have done a little better. Uh, but for some of the new smart cities, uh, if this is a thing, then uh, all of this data and information has value. And we need to continue to collect that value. And the only way that I could see to really gain the, the, the most benefit out of this would be by using some of this public cloud infrastructure. So, uh, so that really concludes uh, the materials we we prepared in these uh, three scenarios. Um, so, uh, Mike, thanks for arguing uh, against yourself many times. Uh, I can respect how hard that is. Uh, we're uh, open for questions. So uh, to repeat the question, I, and I think uh, I really liked your point about uh, medical devices in terms of regulation, the role it has uh, is, are there, I think your question was along the lines of, have you seen it work uh, effectively or not? <laughs> so.
So, so medical devices, um, I think that some of the uh, security companies are working with the FDA to bring some sanity to the regulations, but a regulation that says that uh, in order to apply a patch, you, uh, you, can't, you can't apply the patch economically at all, uh, makes, makes the case that regulations are, uh, need, this, need to be worked out better, right? The way it's written is it's not the regulation is bad necessarily the intent anyway it's that it's the way it's implemented isn't working Right, so for, for FDA validation, um, they did have some rulings that relaxed some of the uh, validation procedures for security patches. Now, the issue as a software provider that we see is that um, separating a security update from a functional update isn't always clear. And that's, that's a place where probably more work has to be done, but if um, if the update is identified specifically as a security fix only, the FDA has an accelerated process now. Uh, I don't know if that applies to medical device, uh, and I know there's some people here working in the device space, but... Uh, yeah. So, so right, right now, uh, the, the essence is that uh, Companies are so frightened of regulation that they take the approach that that any change they have to go through validation. So they they do no updates. There's there's critical drugs being made to relying on XP today, right? That's that's the kind of impact that that current set of regulations has. So from a security perspective, my contention is it's it's a net negative effect right now uh, with what we know that's going on. If you could really island those systems, maybe you could make a case that is working. I, I don't think it is working today. so with a lot of cloud movement, whether it's infrastructure or application, what we are seeing is that we're losing the visibility. I'm not even going to really run into your analysis, and you have to figure out solutions to address that. You know, security monitoring and response, key discovery, how do you achieve that when a lot of those cloud providers have different solutions that offer different levels of depth and breadth of how the information plans to analyze and respond to Right, so that question about transparency in the cloud is a great one, and I, the way I like to look at it is from the lens of uh, OSTMM, right? So the, think of uh, uh, visibility, access, and trust, right? So whenever you take on uh, a third party, you, you have this trust thing, and that's what you get at with respect to uh, is the people I'm trusting, are they transparent about what they're doing in the security space? So, in the case of um, uh, comparing those, wh what we believe is that when you're in a scenario as a critical, critical infrastructure person where you're having to uh, continually trust not one, not two, but three, but dozens of external entities, you can make the case that it's better to shift those to, uh, to a single entity. Uh, you still have the transparency problem with both, the problem is, is there instead of dozens of issues with transparency, there's only one, right? So if you're in that boat, the cloud is superior. If if you're in a case where you're only having to trust one other entity, uh, uh, you you could argue that transparency is the same same with just one uh, as trusting the cloud. It's kind of a cheesy answer, but I think the issue exists in our current world and. Shifting to cloud doesn't change it. It's 
It's just a matter of counting how many external entities uh, do you lack visibility and transparency of. Yes. Right, so to start where I left off with the previous question, right, so so you have the opportunity to re reduce the amount of trust that you have to uh, put outside, right? If you can limit the number of VPN connections instead of dozens of them, just just one connection to the cloud uh, service provider, that's that's a lot better. The the issue of the updates, where professionals are doing the updates, was another piece we touched on, where we believe that a lot of times the public cloud, public infrastructure providers are doing a better job than what we see in uh, uh, people trying to do it themselves. Um, and then the third piece is the enabling scenarios altogether. There were things we talked about that aren't possible without the cloud. And that's, that's probably the big tipping point, when you are able to actually take advantage of pervasive sensing so you know that your pipeline hasn't fallen off a cliff and it's, it's ready to explode, right? So uh, we, need, we need to take advantage, full advantage of the cloud to make it worthwhile. Is the hook coming? One minute. Anyone want to give it a shot? All right, then we thank you.